Okay, we were talking about um, the Van Ayer Popoff trick, and um, in particular, using the Van Ayer Popoff trick to um, do perturbation theory and non abelian gauge theories. And the basic thing is that we can either have um, the Here, let me back up just a bit to get the um, uh, where is it? Yeah, we can either say that product of gauge invariant operators. Well, okay. this is the ground state. Let's say is either either it's a ratio of path integrals where you integrate over everything um, or and, and this can be either an ordinary space or Euclidean space so in Euclidean space it would be, um, so it'd be the Euclidean time order product, and then it would be <coughs> O1, ON e to the minus SE, DA, D psi over. And when I say D psi, I mean D psi bar, D psi. Okay, so that's integrate over all gauges. Okay, so that's one way, and that's a particularly nice expression. But if you want to do perturbation theory, then it's useful to fix the gauge. When you fix the gauge, you break gauge invariants, and then you have to fix it. So you can't just break it and go home. You have to break it and fix it. And um, the trick that we had was... Um, We said that this was an integral O1, ON, e to the i, s. This is a gauge fixing condition. B is some functional of the gauge fixing condition. J is a determinant, dA, d psi. And then we divide by integral e to the i s b of g uh, j d a d psi. So that that's the Fadyev Popov trick, and um, the the simplest favorite gauge fixing condition is uh, g of uh, G of B is uh, minus I D mu A B mu of X. In other words, we're setting the ordinary divergence of A to zero for each of the gauge fields. And um, the favorite B of G is uh, E to the I over 2 integral G A of X a squared d4 of x, and uh, we have an extra i here, so this turns out to be e to the minus i over 2. That's the thing I missed last time, the, where the minus sign came from. d mu a mu b of x squared d4 of x. So that's our, um, our b of g. And when we break gauge invariance this way, then this term combines with the f mu nu squared and gives you a quadratic form in the A's, 
which is invertible and which gives you a nice propagator. And then uh, you can show that the time-ordered product in the bare vacuum or the simple vacuum, a mu x, a b nu y, is uh, the standard Feynman thing, delta a b, uh, delta mu nu of x minus y, and this thing is minus i, eta mu nu delta a b, over q squared minus i epsilon, this is with the Weinberg metric, e to the i q x minus y, this is Lorentz inner product, of course, d fourth q, and then two pi fourth. Okay, so that's, um, so that's, that's what you get as an advantage by breaking gauge invariance, is that a, you don't have to integrate over all the fields, you just integrate over one gauge copy. And secondly, your propagator is just the simple propagator. All right. But, having done that, uh, we have to fix gauge invariance. And uh, the Fedeya Popov trick for fixing gauge invariance then uh, says, well, we have to look at what happens if we make an infinitesimal gauge transformation, and we know that this is uh, a a mu of x minus d mu lambda a of x minus g the structure constants f a b c a b mu of x lambda c of x. So that's how the field transforms under an infinitesimal gauge transformation. Um, on the other hand, our g of a lambda of x is i d mu a lambda a mu of x. Oh, I have it here minus i, I have it there plus i. All right, we'll make it a plus i here, and maybe I should change that. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter we square it, so, so uh, uh, it, it doesn't um, So what, what is GA at lambda? Well, it is, actually, I just wonder, I have my notes. I don't know why I'm going straight from the book when I redid my of redid the notes here. This is, so there's a little more detail here. This would be i d mu a a mu of x minus d mu lambda a of x, that's this part minus g f a b c a b mu of x lambda c of x. So that's, that's what this g is. And um, you recall that what we have to do is we have to take a variational derivative of g, well, before we can do the variational derivative, we have to write this as a uh, matrix acting on a vector. The vector um, is, uh, in fact, the lambdas. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to write this as i d mu a a mu of x plus i d mu and now we're going to write this as an integral, minus delta AC d mu <coughs> minus g f a b c a b mu of x times delta fourth x minus y 
lambda c of y d4 y. Now you see we've written this g a as a matrix acting on a vector. The vector is lambda c of y. So it has, um, it's a very long vector because y has, is, runs over all the points of space time and c runs from 1 to 8 for, for SU3. Um, so this is one humongous uh, vector. And um, let me see. I think I'm actually, yes, I left out a parenthesis. There's a parenthesis here and not there. And so this is then this vector. And of course, just to, just to complete this, uh, let us just say we also have a sum over C. So that's the vector. And um, so now we, we want to take the variational derivative of G lambda A of X with respect to lambda C of Y, and at least we get to do this at lambda equals zero. Okay, well, what does that give us? We're, we're, that basically gives us this whole thing, but we blow away that part. And so what we have, because of this minus sign, is minus i delta ac d mu, d mu is just box, and then there's a delta of x minus y, and I wrote the parenthesis in the wrong place. The parenthesis goes here. Okay, so, sorry, I, I, we, I, now I have to move the parenthesis twice from here to here. It's really there. And so this box is acting on delta. And then it's, uh, what we have left is this part here, and this is minus IG at ABC. And now, I guess I lowered this derivative and raised that one. So I have AB mu uh, of x delta 4 of x minus y. All right, so that's what the variational derivative is. And now we have to take the determinant of this. And um, you can see that if you actually had to do that with your fingers, that would be uh, pretty hopeless. Um, so J is the determinant of minus I delta AC box delta X minus Y minus I G F A B C D D X mu of A mu B of X delta 4 and X minus Y. And you know the parentheses. Okay. Now um, fortunately, we know that the determinant of a matrix is the Grassmann functional integral of the matrix with a minus sign d theta star d theta. And so we throw this up into the exponent, and uh, that means that j, which is a determinant, is an integral of e to the integral i omega a star box omega a. That's because of the delta a c collapses this thing. Plus i g f a b c 
omega a star and maybe just I'll put in x here just to keep things reasonable d mu of a mu b of x omega c of uh, x and um, so that's d mu and um, this is all an integral so this is d fourth x that's the exponent and then down here we functionally integrate over d omega uh, star d omega so we do a Grassmann integral there. Now you might say that uh, the physicists doing this have totally lost control of themselves because um, this is just hopelessly nuts. But actually, remember, we're doing all this in order to do perturbation theory. And how does perturbation theory work? Well, to lowest order, you ignore everything, and the answer is one, and possible a matrix element of one with the states. And since the incoming and outgoing states are different, the lowest order term is zero. And the next term is the simplest thing. You expand the exponential, and you keep the thing that is the lowest power in the coupling constant, and ignore everything else. So this thing that we've created here is not nearly as bad as it looks. Well, it is as bad as it looks, but we're going to ignore most of it. And um, uh, so this is not, uh, it's, it's, it's not as bad as you might think. What this means then, since we have this J, is that if we go back here, See, the B has given us a nice propagator, then we have a J. But we've written J as an exponential, so that means there's a change to S due to J. And if we look at this, we see that we're going to have omegas and this. And so the change in L, uh, the extra terms are I've got here a minus sign. I, we have an I here. So we have an I there. So this is the new term. Well, I think I, well, the new terms are omega A star box omega a, which we can also write as equivalently as uh, we can integrate one of those by parts. And then the other term is uh, this term here, which is, um, we can, for example, integrate this thing by parts. And so this term is minus uh, d mu omega a star G, F, A, B, C. G, of course, is the coupling constant. A, B, mu of X, omega C of X. So these are the extra terms that go into this uh, Lagrange density. And um, I'm a little puzzled as to why I wrote you, 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 Oh, yeah, the integration by parts gives you the minus sign. So these are the extra terms. We, we drop the I because it's I times lambda. And um, well, what this means is that we have some massless scalar fields in the problem. Okay, they're, they're scalar because A is a color index for, for uh, SU3, otherwise it's some flavor index, but it's not a spinner index or a vector index. So these are scalar fields. On the other hand, they are Grassmann scale fields, so they're fermionic scale fields, but it's just a mathematical device. So they don't 
occur on the incoming states or the outgoing states. Um, and since they don't appear in the incoming or outgoing states, but only in the intermediate states, in other words, they, they appear in our minds, but not in the real world, we call them ghosts. And um, I guess that's what real ghosts are. They're things that you imagine and you see in the middle of the night, but they're not really there in the physical world. They're just there in your mind. Um, and so the new, the new uh, action density, let us say, L prime is minus a quarter F A mu nu, F A mu nu, minus a half D mu A A mu squared. This is that gauge fixing term. And then minus D mu omega A star D mu omega A plus D mu omega A star G F A B C A mu C uh, omega B. And uh, I flipped the C and B, which brought in a minus sign there. And then minus uh, psi bar D slash plus M sign, where of course um, d slash is uh, d mu minus i g t a a a mu gamma mu. All right. Um, by the way, I, I remember now that I, um, when I was showing that this that before we broke the gauge invariant, the Lagrangian, which was just this plus that, and didn't have any of these omega terms or this gauge fixing term, that that was gauge invariant. And I showed that this was gauge invariant. I forgot to show that this was gauge invariant. The reason why this is gauge invariant is that this can be written as basically a trace of f mu nu, f mu nu, where f uh, mu nu is basically the commutator of d mu with d nu, um, where uh, d mu is thought of as ordinary d mu and then minus i g t a a mu a, let us say. So this is a matrix. The commutator of the matrices, then, is the F. And um, why is this an engagement invariant? Well, it's that we've arranged this so that U D prime is equal to U, do I have that right? I think so. Ah, yes. So D prime is U D U inverse. And now we can say, what is F prime? Well, F prime is, say mu nu, is U D mu U inverse U D nu U inverse commutator. And this is just U uh, D mu d nu, u inverse, and so that's u, f mu nu, u inverse. And so then, if you take the trace of two of these, the u, u inverse cancels, and because it's a trace, the u and the u inverse, so it's invariant. Okay. So what has this done? Well, um, we fixed the gauge, so we have a nice gauge boson propagator. Then we've got these extra scalar fields that don't occur in the, in the external states. And then we have this one new vertex. And this vertex is something where a gauge boson can come in, and two scalar bosons can go out, one of them having a derivative on it. 
So it's basically something that would be a, a, a P mu, uh, this would give a, a P, it would give whatever the momentum is on this line, or equivalently that line, and then um, the magnitude of this thing is G F A B C, and this would be, let us say, C, and this would be, um, let us say, A and B, and then there'd be a momentum there. So that's the extra vertex. Um, and this is needed, again, to fix the gauge invariance that we broke. And uh, where does this come in? Well, in, uh, suppose we're doing quark, quark scattering. Well, the lowest order diagram is just one, one gluon, say, going across. But then the next diagram would be, well, it would be a gluon and then a fermion, fermion uh, uh, pair like that. But there's also a term gluon, gluon like that. And then finally there's a term Ghost. So the ghosts would occur, for example, in such uh, a scattering process. So when they do, um, and and the same thing is true. I'm, I'm I've been speaking as though we were talking about uh, the strong interactions where it's SU three. But if we had been talking about um, uh, the plot of a standard model that actually works, um, at least where we can see how it works, um, then we're talking. Then these things would be Ws or Zs or photons, and we have an extra. Uh, we have this extra uh, gluon loop there. Uh, not gluon, ghost loop. So that's basically um, what it's like. All right. Any questions? This is a good. I'm, I'm shifting now uh, from my book back to Schwartz, uh, and I'm going to do some things about the uh, Ward identity. And um, so this is a good time to. Ask more questions about this um, about this uh, business. Oh, sorry. So for this core court scattering, could you have cross diagrams where, where you don't like, you can't can you distinguish between the two different courts, the, uh, the one that's on the top there? Okay. Uh, let, let me try. I don't quite understand. So you could like. For electron-electron scattering, you can draw cross diagrams as well. Oh, for yeah. The first lowest order. Line. Yeah, so yeah. Can you do that for the quark as well? Oh, I should think so. Yeah. Um, or would there be any? Well, well. I mean, after all, these quarks carry color indices. Yeah. And flavor indices. Yeah. So this might be. So there are ways to distinguish. Red. And um, if this is a gluon then this is still U, but this could be blue. And then this one might be, um, uh, this could be a down green, and then uh, coming out it would be down and, well, let us see. Um, this is a red anti-blue that's going across. Uh, so if this thing is a blue, uh, blue red, no blue, then uh, it comes out uh, red. Okay, now so so your yeah. So basically, the point of this is that you can distinguish between the quarks, and so the cross diagram wouldn't exist. Well, since uh, the way I did it with one of U and one of D, I don't think you have any cross. Yeah. 
But um, you would also have, you read, uh, you would also have, you read, you read, uh, and here, uh, DB, DB, well, you read, you read down here, and you could then have um, uh, different, momenta up there, yeah. Okay. And in fact, I, I really like the way, sh uh, this is the way um, uh, Weinberg does it. And uh, so this one would be, be like that. And uh, that's if then this works and if these are both the same same kind. Um, all right, any, any other questions? There was an awful lot of mathematics that went through here. Uh, the bottom line, though, you see, is that um, we're doing perturbation theory then in which See, the actual vertices come from psi bar, a gluon in here, psi, and that vertex, of course, is this. So that term gives you this vertex. Then this term gives you this vertex. And then this term gives you two other vertices, one of which is a triple vertex, and the other which is a quadruple vertex because there's a, uh, an a cubed and an a fourth term here. And the a cubed term has a derivative, so there's an extra p mu there. Okay. All right. Okay, now let's, um, Let's talk about these things that, uh, this section on Ward identities is, um, I think, uh, rather um, hard to read. And um, there's part of it in the beginning that I think is totally skippable, so I'm skipping that and just focusing on the Ward part. Uh, that, that's the part where, the part that I'm skipping is the Schwinger-Dyson equations. And I, you know, they're both very clever men, and uh, Schwinger um, was marvelous, like uh, um, Dyson is one of the best writers uh, in physics, uh, so. Anyway, you guys can read it if you want, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't see it coming anymore. So let us instead look at the time order product of uh, psi of x1, psi bar x2. We actually computed this um, last time or the time before, in fact, it was last time on Monday, and um, it came out, I thought, rather nicely from just shifting. In fact, it was essentially this formula. Um, that we uh, we played with this thing and uh, did a shift and and got a, a rather nice uh, expression there. And um, so this, uh, of course, is an integral e to the i integral d fourth x psi bar i d slash plus m psi plus dot dot dot, whatever, and then uh, psi of x1, psi bar x2, d psi bar d psi. Okay, so that's our expression, and uh, whatever else goes in here depends upon what the theory is that we're talking about. Okay. But the The, the cute thing that we can do now is we can say, well, suppose in this functional integral that we do a shift, and the shift is 
we shift the field psi and psi bar. So we say that psi prime is going to be e to the minus i alpha of x psi of x and psi bar prime is going to be e to the i alpha of x psi bar of x. And um, this is a shift in which there's obviously no change in the measure. <clears throat> and now, since we're integrating over all fields, um, we can integrate over psi and psi bar, or we can integrate over psi prime and psi bar prime, we get the same answer. So there can't be any change when we do this. On the other hand, we can also pretend that we didn't know that and compute what the first order change is. And um, if we do that, well, we see that um, I psi bar prime of x d slash psi of x prime. By the way, the, this something that some physicists do where they write psi goes to psi e to the i of x. The thing that's always bothered me is I don't know what goes to means. In other words, what the hell does goddamn arrow means? So I much prefer to write psi prime equals, then I know what we're talking about. Um, Coleman used to do the, the arrow thing and it would drive me crazy. Well, not crazy, but it would, I didn't think it was helpful. Anyway, I, psi bar of x, d slash, psi of x, and um, the extra term is um, what? Well, this thing will bring down a minus i alpha. And so this thing is psi bar of x gamma mu psi of x d mu alpha of x. So that's what that is. And uh, the other term there, psi prime of x1, psi bar prime x2, this is e to the i alpha of x2 minus i alpha of x1, psi of x1, psi bar. Right. So those, so if we just compute this straight and ask what is the change here, well, we know it has to be zero to first order, and uh, so what would we get? We would get, well, it has to be zero to all orders, but this thing would be e to the i s, where s means whatever is that. And then what comes down, assume, we're assuming here that the, that the size that we're changing, that we're doing this phase, trans, phase transformation on, appear in the action only like this. Okay. So in particular, we have, um, we've, um, We don't have any other size up there, so this is the change due to the alpha. Okay, so what what is this change then? Well, it's going to be first order. It's i integral psi bar of x, and now d slash. This d mu alpha of x is effectively d slash alpha of x, although I'm not sure there's any point. Anyway, that's what I did. D of x, psi of x, I mean, uh, d fourth x. This comes from the uh, from the exponent, and then the psi of x one, psi bar of x two, and then d psi bar d psi. So that's part of it. The rest of it is plus e to the i s i alpha of x2 minus i alpha of x1 psi of x1 psi bar of x2 d psi bar d psi. Okay. So, in other words, 
We know the functional integrals invariant under this phase transformation because we're integrating over all fields anyway, so this is just a shift. It's like the integral of f of x plus y dx plus y is the same thing as the integral of x dx. And um, so we get that this, all of this has to be zero. And um, all right, so where was I here? Do I, let me just see, we got that and that. Okay, so the conclusion then is that an integral d4 of x, alpha of x, I d mu of this path integral, e to the i s, psi bar of x gamma mu psi of x, psi of x1, psi bar x2, d psi bar d psi, this then must equal integral d4 of x uh, alpha of x and i delta of x minus x2 minus i delta x minus x1. Okay. So that's what comes out of uh, this. And Um, let me just, this looks awfully simple here. I think I left out a, uh, an input of the path integral on the right hand side, e to the i s, psi of x1, psi bar x2, d psi bar d psi. Okay. okay, so that's um, what we get. And Writing it one more time, we have the derivative of the integral e to the i s psi bar of x gamma mu psi of x psi of x1 psi bar x2 d psi bar d psi is delta of x minus x2 minus delta of x minus x1 integral e to the i s psi x1 psi bar x2 d e psi bar d psi. Okay. Notice that, what does this mean? This is associated with the charge of the electron minus, and this is the charge of the positron. And if we switch to a, an abbreviated note, a more compact notation, the compact notation that um, Schwartz uses, in this compact notation, let me just rem remind you of what it is. The idea is that um, this is ground state, time ordered product, whatever. So in other words, brackets just mean time ordered product in the ground state. Okay. So what do we have? Well, all of this, of course, is the time ordered product of this times that. And this thing here is what we call the uh, current. That's the current. And so using uh, Schwartz's notation, then we can write this as d mu, j mu of x, psi of x1, psi bar of x2, time order product in the vacuum, is this. And this again, what is this? This gives you a time order product of these two um, fields. And uh, so this is delta of x minus x2 minus delta x minus x1 
psi of x1, psi bar x2. And of course, this is just the Feynman propagator for the electron. And um, OK, so another way of looking at this is that if you take the derivative of, or the divergence of the current, but the current is inside, is, uh, it's, it's, it's in other words, in other words, if I go back to ordinary language, time-ordered product, ground state, time-ordered product of all this, we differentiate, take the divergence, when the d mu hits the j mu inside, you get zero because the divergence of the current is zero. That's current conservation. And um, what this tells you is that because of the time-ordered product, which has those delta functions of time-ordering in it, you wind up with extra delta functions. These are four-dimensional delta functions of the Feynman propagator. Okay. So that's the that's the um, expression, and one can think of this as the schwinger dyson equation for charge conjugation, if we want. So, actually, I did use some of the schwinger dyson I just didn't want to do all of it. Um, so, in other words, you get that d mu j mu is zero apart from these delta function terms, which are called contact terms. And if we write it more generally, we get something like this. d mu, and I think it's clearer to go back to ordinary language here, j mu of uh, x psi 1 of x1 psi bar 2 of x2, say a mu some photon field in x3, psi bar 4 of x4, and these might not all be electrons and positrons, but these are just fields with some sort of charges, q1 and so forth. So this is q1 delta x minus x1 minus q2 delta x minus x2 minus q4 delta x minus x1. Notice we skip this one because there isn't any charge associated with it. Also because uh, the fermion fields commute with the uh, photon field. So dot, 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 times zero time ordered product uh, psi 1, x1, psi bar 2, x2, a nu, x3, psi bar 4, x4, dot, dot, dot. And let me just see. I suppose. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So that's the general. Uh, that's the more general expression. QI is charge of particle absorbed by psi i. Any questions? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, um, that um, uh, side five because this is minus i i power x tends. Uh, wait a minute. I, I, let me try to get it straight. What now? Psi prime equals equal to the minus. Psi prime is equal to minus i alpha psi. So that's the local gauge. Yes. So this tells us that the local gauge invariance gives us the uh, kind of charge conservation. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to say yes, because what you're saying sounds so plausible. Um, and on the other hand, the, 
the actual derivation didn't seem to use that. And in fact, the action here need not be invariant on the local gauge transformations, right? I mean, uh, we ignored any possible photon field here. We just said that the functional integral was invariant when we made this transformation because it's because we're integrating over all fields anyway, so it doesn't matter whether we call them psi or psi prime. I all right, let me let me let me make it in fact let the clearer, I hope. Remember, um, this thing here is invariant on is invariant on the global gauge transformation. And it's the global gauge transformation which is sufficient to give us charge conservation. The, the crazy thing is that the extraordinary extra symmetry of local gauge invariance doesn't give us any, well, it doesn't give us any, any extra conservation law as far as, I'm, well, it does give us one, but I've never seen anybody do anything with it. In other words, there is a concerted there is a conserved, current that's conserved because of gauge invariance, and then there's a current that's invariant under gauge transformation. There are two different currents. Oh, well, look, this is all quite astray. It's global gauge invariance that gives us this. <coughs> okay. Now, we can rewrite these. Uh, in a certain way that um, I'm not sure that it I'm not sure that it's all that useful but let's just do it because um, for sure so we're basically going to take the Fourier transform of all this stuff so we're going to define this to be integral d4 of x, d4 of x1, d4 of x2, e to the i p x plus i q1 x1 minus i q2 x2, zero time order product psi bar x, gamma mu psi of x, so that's j of x psi of x1, psi bar x2. Okay, so that's our definition of this. <clears throat> and then we're going to uh, define something else, an m0 of q1 and q2. And this is an integral d4 of x1, d4 of x2, e to the i q1 x1 minus i q2 x2 zero time order product psi x1 psi bar x2 and in particular it follows then that uh, m0 mu no there's no mu M0 of um, Q1 plus P1 comma Q2. Now that's Q1 plus P. I mistook a comma for a 1. This then is D4 X D4 X1 D4 X2 e to the i p x plus i q1 x1 minus i q2 x2 delta 4 x minus x1. So we're just writing things in a uh, long-winded way. Time ordered product of psi of x1 psi bar x2. Okay, so the idea here is you integrate over d uh, over x 
and that uh, just turns this P into an X1, and so this is really M0 of P plus Q1, that's all that is. All right. We are getting very short of board space, um, also short of chalk. Um, all right, because we have very little board space, I'll try to write here. I, P mu, M mu, of P, Q1, and Q2. So that's P on that. So, in fact, I, P. So we have an I, so let's just do it in <coughs> this way. We have an I, P, mu here. That's the same thing as taking a derivative with respect to x mu here. And then we can integrate by parts, and that gives us minus a d mu on this thing. And so this gives us then d fourth x, d fourth x1, d fourth x2, dvi px, plus i q1 x1 minus i q2 x2 minus d mu of um, zero time ordered product psi bar of x gamma mu psi of x psi x1 psi bar Okay, so that's what I, P mu, M mu is. On the other hand, we know that D mu acting on all of this is over here, D mu acting on J mu psi psi bar is a couple of delta functions times psi psi bar. And so this thing is actually integral d fourth x, d fourth x1, d fourth x2, same exponential, e to the i, and I'll just write dot, 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 times delta of x minus x1 minus delta x minus x2 times vacuum time ordered product psi x1 bar x2. So, that's what we have. On the other hand, if we now look at this, maybe I should have written those things. It's e to the i p x plus i q1 x1 minus i q2 x2. And now, if we look at what these are in terms of these definitions, we can see that this says that I P mu of M mu of um, P Q1 Q2 is, this turns out to be M0 of Q1 plus P1, Q1 plus P comma Q2 minus M0 of Q1 comma Q2 minus P. So this is one way of writing the Ward Takahashi uh, identity. Um, frankly, I think writing it this way is much less clear than writing it this way. It's the same thing, but here it's clear what's going on. Here, you have to say, oh, this was an, you know, what are these M's? Well, they're Fourier transforms of such and such. Um, Schwartz likes this expression, though, and he writes it in a symbolic way, P mu uh, And this 
this is Q1 plus P, Q2, Q1, P plus Q2. No, Q2 minus P, sorry. All right, and these, he thinks of these as momentum space Feynman rules with propagators on the external lines, but no external uh, polarization uh, vectors on the external lines. And there's a generalization of this, which is, um, well, let me, let me ju just skip it. It's, ba uh, it's basically that, um, I, P mu of M mu, a lot of different arguments, is a sum over the outgoing particles, their charges, minus a sum over the incoming particles, their charges, and the sum is only over the charged particles. And, um, all right, maybe I should write it down. You want me to write it down? It's, I think it's better for you to read it in the book because it's, um, it's a little too, um, Technical. Okay, now, um, these Ward identities, one of the, um, another way of writing them or thinking about them is to imagine we have some S matrix element, which is some polarization vector times, let us say, something I'll call S mu. And we saw, when we were talking about QED last semester, that zero was P mu S mu. In other words, and the reason for that is that P mu S mu is effectively the derivative acting on a current. And so, uh, apart from contact terms, that would vanish. And in fact, in the S matrix case, it does in fact, vanish. Um, so, uh, one way of thinking about that is to write this as epsilon mu box on, let us say, a mu dot dot dot, where I'm using his time ordered product uh, notation. And what is this? Well, this would be box on a mu, of course, is j mu. That's the Maxwell equations. So this thing is epsilon mu j mu plus contact terms. In other words, those delta things. And it turns out that these contact terms don't contribute to the S matrices. And the reason is that the contact terms uh, uh, represent disconnected diagrams which don't matter in the S matrix. Um, the LSZ, remember, formalism tells us that some process which uh, two final state photons, S matrix, something or other coming in, is epsilon mu, epsilon k alpha, and there'll be an i to the n integral p fourth x e the i p x box mu nu, box mu nu sub x basically, integral dot dot dot, integral p fourth x k e to the i p k x k, box, maybe I should say sub k alpha beta, integral dot dot dot, and then all of that dot 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 finally acts on vacuum time order product a nu of x dot dot dot, a, a beta xk dot dot dot, zero. Okay, so this is very long-winded, very complicated. Um, I was tempted to skip this completely. It's almost the end of the hour. I'll finish because we're here. Um, what is this box mu nu? Box mu nu is box eta mu nu minus 
1 minus 1 over C d mu d mu. So this is the um, this is the box for the propagator that we had. In other words, instead of the ordinary box, we've got this propagator. And of course, it, it's something that acts on a mu nu. A mu, or a nu in this case. So the idea is box mu nu, a nu is j mu. That would be the idea. Um, okay, so if we now make you, now we look at this LSE formula and we have all these boxes acting on time ordered products, we know, what does this give us? Well, it gives us, the boxes just come in, hint the A's and give us J's, that's fine. Then there are also contact terms, but the contact terms are all disconnected diagrams, so they don't contribute to S matrix elements. I think I, I think we can stop at this point for this chapter. It's a, it's a chapter with far too many indices um, and uh, notation that's excessively compact. All right, the next topic um, is uh, renormalization and. Um, I think we'll give we'll 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 try uh, following Schwartz. If if he goes off the rail, then uh, I'll switch to Weinberg or something. So, are there any questions? Remember, I've got a whole new box of candy. So. This was a big mouthful today. Um, Maybe I should just say a couple of words about the ghosts. The idea basically is, the idea of Popov showed us we can either integrate over all gauges or we want to do perturbation theory, break gauge invariance, put in the gauge fixing term like that. And this uh, Jacobian here, basically, this breaks it, this fixes it. And uh, this Jacobian then is a Partial a functional derivative of gauge fixing term with respect to the uh, infinitesimal gauge parameter. That's a determinant. The determinant we can write as an exponential of uh, Grassmann fields. Those Grassmann fields get interpreted as uh, ghosts, which is to say scalar fermions. They occur only in internal processes, not in the external states. And um, they basically in perturbation, but it, because they only, because we're doing perturbation theory, that this whole apparatus of determinants of infinite dimensional matrices doesn't really uh, hit us in the face. The only thing we have is an extra vertex, one new vertex, which is simply a gluon uh, and two uh, scalar fermions. All right, I think that's enough. We can stop unless there's a question. Okay.